thanks to the Chamber of Commerce for hosting this and the exhibition and the this morning. Thanks to Bex for her hard work on the new course for this event on this morning. Um, just a really quick to get through history. Not too long, I promise you. Um, UNESCO was in the cocktails immediately after the Second World War. Um, and in fact, they didn't really waste any time as it was formed in uh, November of 1945. And this week actually marks the 75th anniversary of UNESCO. And we're doing a bit of celebrating on that around our social media channel this week. It was formed to um, build peace in the minds of men and women. Is a catchphrase, but it's basically to kind of foster cooperation and understanding across the world. The Biosphere Programme is um, one of UNESCO's many programmes. You're probably familiar with World Heritage Sites, if not the others. There are also things called Creative Cities and Geoparks. Um, Biospheres really came about in the late 1960s when um, environment ministers from across the world came together to sort of lament the fact that there was no investment in the natural world. You know, the, the the world had been rebuilding after the World War, and you know, all the emphasis was on um, the sort of infrastructure of rebuilding towns and cities, and the, the environment was sadly, sadly neglected. Um, and so the, the program was initially all about human and ecosystem relationships and about the remediation of land and species and habitats. It was very much based in the natural world. Um, Around right about 1995, there was a big sea change in the Biosphere program um, when it was kind of accepted and realized that. Really, it's about the way we live our lives, you know, it's, you know, humans impact on the planet more than anything else impacts on the planet. Um, and so at that point, it became a very holistic program that takes into account human activity, economic growth, cultures, heritage, and even areas of spirituality and the way that, you know, that all integrates with the natural world. I'll leave you to look at that definition of biospheres. Um, the definition of biosphere as well as what really fits the program changes all the time, the planet changes all the time. Um, but it's easy to see from that, I think, why biospheres are sometimes called living laboratories. You need two basic ingredients to be a biosphere. You need a pretty special environment, a pretty special natural environment, and a population committed to keeping it that way. Um, you also need about three years to put in your application and get your whole community behind you and get everyone to sign up to the ethos of it. So the Isle of Man started work on becoming a biosphere in 2013 and became a biosphere in 2016. There's one round of admissions each year to the biosphere network. Biosphere stands for three things. Development, but in a sustainable way. So it's absolutely not about prohibition or saying you know, development can't happen. UNESCO accepts that people need to live and work and go to school and have jobs and travel and consume, um, but it's about how you do that. It also stands for conservation, and that's not just conservation of species and habitats and landscapes, but conservation of all that we hold dear, so our next language, for example, which we you know, safeguard and cherish and is growing, and you know, the, way that we, the way that we live our lives, that unique thing that makes us the Isle of Man. And finally, it's promoting learning and research, um, which kind of brings the two together if you think about it. You know, we're, 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 you know we, we need to grow, we need to conserve. The learning bit is a bit that sits in the middle for me. You know, that's kind of the opportunity to kind of come up with sustainable solutions. There are 714 biosphere reserves, 129 countries, and 257 million people live in biosphere reserves. So that's quite um mind-boggling figure if you think about it, you know, the power of those people to kind of make change and lead a more sustainable future. Um, and it's roughly about the size of Australia, I figured out, hence the, hence the blue arrow on that. <laughs> so how can your business, and I, most of you here today, I think are from this business, although I know some government colleagues are joining us, how can your business get involved with Biosphere? You can take the Biosphere pledge. You can apply to become a partner, and in doing so, you promise to do your best for the economy, the community, the culture, the heritage, and for the environment. It's not a binding contract, it's promise. You know, you kind of say, we, we think we do quite well in this area, we don't do so well in the other areas, you know, we'd like to do better. And it's about joining the movement, really. You know, we've all got a stake in the future of the Isle of Man, haven't we? And we all want to live in a place where we sustain everything that we hold dear and that we have a better future. We always say no costs and no clipboards, so it's free to apply to become a biosphere partner. 
and you don't have us around auditing you every every year. Um, why isn't it more elite? Why isn't it harder to become a biosphere partner? Um, we figured that we'd rather have an awful lot of businesses and, and organisations at some part of the journey than have a sort of very elite, narrow scheme where everyone was sort of, you know, it was a market perfection. Um, so it's much better that people are starting off trying to do the right thing than, you know, we sort of have a very small number of people who qualified. Um, and why isn't it completely application free? Why do you have to apply? Um, you know, why isn't it just a sticker on the window and we've all got one? Well, you know, it, it is about making that commitment to a more sustainable future. As businesses, you really have power to create great change. You consume, you purchase, you waste, you travel, you light buildings, and, uh, you know, you, 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 you're much more than the individual. You, you, can, you can drive change. And you have great influence as well. You know, you influence your workforce. In some cases, very large workforces in the other one. Um, you, you influence your customers. You know, people pay attention to what you do. So you've had a really difficult year. Um, you know, we're, a lot of us are struggling to even deal with the here and now and get back on our feet after the strange events of the last few months. Why should looking to the future even be something that you do right now? I kind of understand that. Um, this is a quote from um, Wim Bartels. Uh, KPMG carries out the biggest global audit of business sustainability, it's a bi biennial um, study across all sectors, across the entire globe. Amazing that they've been doing it since 1993. Um, and what he's basically saying here is that years ago, sustainability, CSR, whatever you want to call it, was kind of over there, you know, you sent off your staff for a week to do build a footpath or something, and then you came back and you forgot all about it. Um, these days, it's becoming as important to boards and organizations as financial auditing, for example. You know, so you wouldn't dream, you wouldn't have a business that didn't sort of follow financial regulations and subscribe to, you know, financial auditing. And, you know, boards and you know, stakeholders, shareholders are going to be really looking at this as a central part of organizations from now on. Obviously, uh, that's just a snapshot, and I appreciate that's actually quite hard to see. That's just a snapshot from the very last, um, Global report that KPMG did. Um, the sectors that are most heavily regulated already, such as sort of oil and gas exploration and chemicals and things like that, not surprisingly, are the ones that <clears throat> do the most reporting on their CSR and their sustainability. Um, but the astonishing finding really is that more than two thirds of businesses across every single sector are reporting some way or another on their sustainability efforts. So what does your business gain from engaging in more sustainable practices and what do they even mean? Um, I think the year we've had has shown us what happens when our whole world becomes completely destabilised and you know everything that we took as a foundation sort of goes, goes awry. Um, but having robust ecosystems really matters to every single business, whether it's materials you source, whether it's getting goods and you know services to the island with extreme weather. Um, you know, whether it's the well-being of your staff because, you know, there's pollution incidents or, you know, other, other things that affect the, the biodiversity of the island. It, it, it kind of all is intrinsic to, you know, to, to the success of your business. Reputation is another one. I'm breaking these down into five R's. Um, people increasingly care about who they do business with, who they purchase from. Um, the ethics of the company, what that company stands for. I don't consider myself to be any kind of eco warrior. I'm probably just the average woman in the middle, but you know, I try to consume local. I try to look at the ethics of companies that I purchase from and look at their statements online and find out what they actually stand for. Um, only yesterday there was a story in the news about Marks and Spencer and you know, hiring them and, and having clothes made by. Um, you know, factory workers in, in countries where it, the standards were unacceptable, pay rates were unacceptable, you know, and that's the type of thing that people are noticing these days. Mm -hmm. I mean, probably most of you fall also into that category. Third R is around recruitment. Um, one of the island's biggest employee, employers said to me recently that five years ago, people thinking about moving to the island were inquiring about tax rates, shops, nightlife. Now they want to know what the company stands for. And what's your company's green credentials are, um, and what company's doing about it. So, you know, you, you, your, your recruits now are, are ethical young people who, you know, want to work for the right organisation. 
and then reward the bottom line. Um, not only are there savings to be made by adopting more sustainable practices, and we could be talking about packaging or energy or travel or the way you communicate, um, but there's obviously also reward in sustainable production itself. You know, people need things, you know, as, as, as life evolves, and you know, wherever there's a gap in the market, people develop the product. So. And fifth thing, the fifth R really is it's just the right thing to do, you know, to have an eye on the future and think about the future of our island and the future of our planet. I'm sure we all do. But be very careful though that it isn't just greenwashing. I think after homemade, having eco in front of something is the most sort of misused um, prefix in the world. <laughs> um, and there's a whole body of people out there now, including journalists and journalistic organizations who are out there trying to sort of pull down the businesses who are over claiming and over promising um you know so certainly if, you know, from a business reporting point of view you've got to be very careful that you you know that what you're actually saying that you're delivering does actually tie in with sustainable practice <laughs> well, the good news is that you're not on your own with this um we're going to hear an amazing example recently and it's shortly a company that's really embraced this um but you're not on your own. There's a, there's, a, there's a raft of reading out there at the moment. There is loads and loads of stuff. Whichever sector you represent, you can go on to and find, you know, what could I consider for my business? Um, and there are also a lot of experts at the end of man, actually. The KPMG survey alone is worth a really good read because it gives some ideas right across the sectors. It gives some really good sort of start points. The less good news is that you're all completely different. So I can't say to you, here's how your business can become more sustainable because your business will be completely different to your business and your business, and you might like to do something around energy, and you might like to do something around transportation, and you know, it kind of varies from organization to organization. Um, <clears throat> some sort of starters for 10 really are that you can build sustainability and more sustainable practice into your everyday in your business. Um, it doesn't have to be a specific discrete piece of work over kind of there. So you can have it on your agendas, you can talk about it in your team meetings, you can build it into your end of year awards or your staff rewards or whatever, you know, whatever scheme you have to recognize your achievements at the end of the year. You can use your people. Why not make it part of your job advert, part of your interview process, part of your induction um, to kind of set out your sustainable credentials and your ambitions in that direction of what you would like to do and have your staff drive it forward. Because I can pretty much guarantee that on any reasonable, you know, medium to large size organisation, you're going to have people on your organisation who are interested in this area and want to make a difference. And we can all grow and learn together as an island. It's new, this stuff, you know, it's not like we've been doing it for years. So, think small would be my top tip to take away from today, actually. And I think Lauren and Martin may build on this a little bit. Um, you know, the planet is in trouble, it needs big solutions, it needs bold initiatives. But you haven't got time, you know, you're busy business people getting back on your feet after COVID and running, you know, running, a, you know, it's, a, it's tough running a business, isn't it? You know, you only have so much time and you probably want to concentrate on your website and this and that and the other. And, um, just do one thing and do it well, you know, and think, how did that go? And then move on and, you know, think, oh, I made that little change, you know, I took the plastic out of the kitchen last week or, you know, we've cut our paper down by 50% or something, and celebrate that success. You're not going to save the planet alone, you know, but if we're all doing together, we will. And use your influence too. I know you're all business rivals, but we're all citizens of this amazing place we call the biosphere. We're really lucky to have this back and it's very hard earned. So, you know, your solution will be one that a business down the road is looking for right now. So, you know, be willing to share your expertise. And that's something we hope to build on as Biosphere in terms of events that bring people together to kind of share ideas and achievements. And shout about your successes. It goes without saying you want people to know. So it's fine that your shareholders know. It's fine that your board knows. Um, tell people, you know, do some communication about what you're doing. Maybe it's a small achievement. Um, let us know about it, and we can feature you in our communications as well. You know, we do, we do really, on the benefits of being biased with partners, we really share each other's stories and achievements and successes, and, you know, so that kind of amplifies what you're doing around the world. Um, our UNESCO bosses globally do really keep an eye on the Isle of Man because we're the only entire nation biosphere, um, so they're very, very interested in the work that's going on over here. So, you know, you will get some communications out of it, you will get 
for that reputation out of it and hopefully more customers, more trade. But tell us where you need help. So for the very first time, we are going to be very shortly building on Nicole's programme. We're going to be doing a survey of all businesses in the Isle of Man and Chamber of Commerce and Department of Enterprise will be helping us to roll that out, hopefully within the next week. Um, and there's a menu to tick, you know, which areas are you baffled by, which areas do you need help on? And we're going to run a pilot training scheme next year and we'll prioritise partners, but it's we're going to survey all businesses and hopefully we might have space to include businesses who are not partners as well. Um, you know, so inexorably we all sort of upskill ourselves. We also celebrate the achievements of our advisory with partners through annual awards, which are great exposure, a great, great extra reason to come on board as a partner. Um, so we didn't, that was our first awards. Um, we have awards for environment, energy, um, economy and education. And we've had another award since then. This year we didn't have our awards because we didn't feel like the Open Man was a particularly celebratory mood, but our minister made a video thanking all our partners. And we go through quite a good exposure and some nice photographs of some of our partners. So we'll be back on the awards trail next year. 2021 is going to be quite an exciting year for Biosphere. Um, we're going to be doing this training. We have a brand new strategy coming out, which we're calling Working Together for a Sustainable Future. And you'll see a high profile launch of that around about January or February. If anyone in my life can get it done. Um, a new website which will be much more supportive with partners and contain their stories and their ideas and their progress. It's also the 50th year of Biospheres, so it's really quite an exciting time for you to sort of come on board and you know, sort of join in the momentum that we've, that we've got going. We all work together for a sustainable future. Before I hand over to um, Martin and Lauren, I just wanted to sum up really, you know, the Isle of Man is part of this really prestigious um, global <coughs> project and platform. Um, it does mark us out as a place that's special, it marks us out as a place with a conscience, a place that wants to get things right. Um, it's most definitely a platform for better decision making, governmentally, organisationally and individually, because we can all make a difference. Um, this is very much on people's minds right now, you know, we, we, I think the year we've had is actually the game made us a rampant budget. And as a biosphere partner, you are demonstrating that you are committed to that sustainable future. Quick plug for um, a webinar we had. Um, we've only been able to deliver a programme for businesses thanks to having Nicole um, on board. Nicole is a UCM master's student. Um, she's been working with us for six months to talk to business partners and say, you know, how can you get more from being a biosphere partner? How can the island get more from you being a biosphere partner? Um, We've had some training webinars, we have an event like this, an event for partners, we've got the business training coming up. Um, this is a real coup. Um, this gentleman is um, one of the global experts in business sustainability and I've been chasing after him for years to deliver a webinar for us and he's finally, finally agreed. So um, it's next Wednesday, we do have places left. If anyone wants to sign up, grab Nicole on the way out or you know, drop her an email or whatever. Um, hopefully it's going to be a really good end to the webinar series. I'm going to hand over now to um, Zurich International, who I met with about two years ago, I think, <laughs> when we sat around and chewed the fat over <laughs> this weird sustainability thing. And you just made amazing progress since. And I think their story is actually worth a lot of words from me, to be honest with you. So I'll shut up and hand over to you guys. And then we'll do some questions at the end, if that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I guess a big, a big thank you for inviting us along uh, to the, the Biosphere team and as well to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, so yeah, I guess we're really here to talk about how we kind of formed as a group, uh, what our journey is to date, and I guess we can answer it. If you want us to stop and ask any questions during, if not, we can make something for Feel free to keep us interactive as you want. So first thing probably should do some introductions. So there I am. Don't look quite like that anymore. Enjoy some photography. Um, I'm the anti-service manager at Zurich. I started about 
10 years ago now. I know, I only look about 12. No, yeah, <laughs> 10, 10 years ago now. Um, and I worked in IT as a junior administrator, just come out of school. Um, and I've worked my way up since. Yeah, that's, that's me looking with rather puffy eyes. Uh, you might notice I'm also sporting a ginger moustache when I'm in November. Um, so I've been with Zurich since 2013, probably not as long as Lauren. Started as administrator as well, more recently in HR on the secondment. So I've kind of come through a few different roles and I think sustainability is something that we're quite passionate about to continue. Um, so I guess moving on to kind of how we formed and where we got up to. Um, we initially kind of formed out of a talent development program we were both on. Um, we were given basically two words, which was market presence. Um, and the premise was basically have increase it. So we weren't really given any context in how Zurich could do that. So obviously it was a bit fraught and frantic to try and think how can you increase the market presence of a business without any experience. Um, so what we kind of pinned it down to was three main things. Uh, sustainability, career in HR and business development. So in terms of the biosphere, we've seen sustainability as something we can really look into. And that was kind of where we've seen a lot of value and we're quite passionate about it as well, to be honest. So we had various meetings, as Joe alluded to, um, to try and understand what on earth sustainability could mean for a large business. Like Martin said, we had no experience. We were relatively junior at the time. Um, weren't, uh, in any of the Exco meetings or anything like that. So I had no idea really. Um, so we spoke to her and she gave us heaps and heaps of information, which really helped us make the decision of actually, yes. And in 2019, we officially became a ISP partner. And then we decided that becoming a ISP partner wasn't gonna just be a tick on the box. We wanted to continue it. Um, it was me and Martin leading the way during a massive, <laughs> massive company and we were the ones going, we need to start listening to this, we need to start being aware. Um, so we then developed the Green Committee. Um, we have about probably three official members, yeah. but luckily the way that we kind of formed it is that whilst there are three people probably running and making sure that it's a forefront of everyone's thoughts, We've got everyone on board, so the staff are like giving us information. We have newsletters that go out monthly. They come to us with ideas, and if we can deliver them, we work to deliver them. So we basically use their voice and then deliver it through what we can do ourselves. So it is a very much a case of company wide, with actually quite minimal effort. She says. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think plug into that. It didn't just happen overnight. So I think when we first kind of said we were a biosphere partner, I think it took a little while for people to kind of really think and go, what did that mean? Um, and some people did just think it was a tick box exercise. Oh, we're just doing this for sustainability reasons. But I think people start to warm to it. They actually acknowledge it's dedicating something to the islands. It's not just a business commitment. It's actually a bit more than that. It's actually going, what can we all pull together to do and support towards this common goal? Um, so yeah, so initially there was some it was quite hard to get the initial buy-in, I guess even from our seniors and things like that as well. But I think it was something like the biosphere really gave that kind of vision to kind of align to and really focus your attention. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, so we, we had a lot of ideas and at the time we weren't assigned a budget. So <laughs> as you can imagine, that was quite difficult. Um, but you'll see in the next few slides that actually with basically no budget, you can change so much. And now we've, we've thankfully got the buy-in of, of the business, which you'll hear about later. So I am gonna read, because we've done so much over the, <laughs> over the last year or so that I have to read this so I don't forget what we've done. So you'll see our lovely new building in the top corner. Now this was built in 2017 and we weren't a partner at that time, however, it was built with making sure that we were being as sustainable as we could possibly be anyway. So we have energy saving built into the core design. We have timed LED lights. We have temperature controlled workspaces and on-demand heated water via automatic taps. We also have, <laughs> oh no, here we go, you're 
We also have, so you can, we have our lovely little bikes here. So we've got um, a purpose-built bike rack in our car park. We've also got showers and changing facilities. Now, we went a little bit further with this and thought, well, yeah, man, okay, it's not raining today, but nine times out of 10, it's raining. So if our staff come in and it's been raining, they're not gonna want to sit all day in wet clothes. So we actually got a dry room and a wet room where they can put their clothes in one of the rooms and it will be dry by the time they get, get to go home. So they just bring a change of clothes in and they don't need to worry. So then on their commute home, they're not riding home in soggy clothes, basically. And <clears throat> um, we partnered up with Cycle360 to go that little bit further and we provided 10 electric bikes to our staff. They could use it as and when they pleased. They just booked it out. They could go the bike rides. Through lunch, we have flexible working, so they could take a two-hour lunch to go for a bike ride, and that was absolutely fine as long as we've spoken to their boss, obviously, to make sure they're aware. Um, it also allowed them to take them home during the weekdays, so if you wanted to commute from Moncombe, for example, but couldn't afford an electric bike, you could take one of ours and then obviously bring it back the next day. Um, during COVID, we actually gave these to the police. Um, to use, and I believe they had a really good uptake, and they made quite a few yeah. discoveries. Yeah, I think <laughs> they, the they made the comment that they actually made more arrests using those than they had. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I think it's because they're out and about and actually in the field, per se. So I think that was kind of one of their things. And because they're obviously super fast. <laughs> 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 to further cut down on the cars. So obviously we used to be in Apple Street, we used to be in town, and everyone knows how nice it is to be in town, especially when you've just got like a few little errands at lunch. And we were finding that our staff were driving from the business park down, so we changed that. We put on a mini bus three times a week um, that you sign up for during the day. If you haven't signed up by half 11 and there's no one booked on it, it's cancelled, so it's not a wasted journey. Um, and they can just use that in that spring, and they get picked up at various different spots. Um, and that's between the hours of 12 and 2. So if you wanted to take that extra long lunch again, you could, you could come back on the later one. So then we were already recycling paper because who isn't? Everyone, everyone is doing it. So we looked at what else we could do. So this is my long list Let's get again. We extended our recycling efforts. We now recycle plastic, cans and tins, batteries, coffee pods, milk cartons, and printing toners. Um, yeah, quite a lot. <laughs> and then we influence our colleagues at the, at the same time. So we invited Stephanie Gray, who is the head of waste management, and she came in and she held an informal session in our canteen one lunch time. Um, and it was just to tell our staff all about the recycling things that are available to them. So a lot of people didn't know about curbside recycling in Douglas. And um, it was just to let them know that actually this is already there. You don't need to change the change the world. You can just sign up to one little thing and make a massive difference. So then what else did we start to do? So we removed all single use plastic. So this is a big one for us. Um, we also reduced our printing last year by 30%. And our target for 2020 was to reduce our printing by another 80%. Now COVID has helped that, not going to lie, we weren't in the office, we weren't printing, <laughs> happy day. Um, however, obviously we've been back in the office for a little while now and we're actively monitoring it to make sure and we are still at the moment on target to reach that 80%, which is an amazing feat for such a massive company. So yeah, that's another one that we've kind of, our little win. Yeah. <laughs> um. So in terms of energy reduction, in 2019, we got a 9.6%. I'd like to round up to 10, but we've got to be accurate, um, which was mainly done through four actions. So air conditioning was, so when we moved into the building, not much focus was done around what the systems were. So you can actually segregate, you can come switch on certain units in certain areas, and you can really kind of use that system to your advantage, but no one had really kind of thought to take it that step further. So what we did is, with air conditioning, we now shut off at 6.30. So there's still air circulation, but actually air conditioning stops. So because of the actual building retains the heat, there's no need to kind of have air conditioning on past that point. Um, made sure the cleaners were comfortable with that as well, so if they're in a bit later. Um, 
we can we also segregate by the floor. So in terms of if people working overtime or at the weekends or close on bank holiday, but we may have people in the office. We have people on one floor. We really restrict the energy use to that one floor, especially turn off all the other. We can actually segregate it into that. So we're using just the clever use of what you can do with your building. Um, acknowledge that people may not have that functionality, but I think it's just thinking of what little things you might be able to do with the systems you have in place. Um, lastly, we had our digital notice boards. So we now have these just to turn on when people are in the office. So I think before they were lighting up the night sky <laughs> if you were driving past, but I think it's just trying to think of those little incremental things that we could do. Um, so get encouraging staff to turn off their monitors rather than being on standby. Um, it's those little things that all add up to that bigger change. Yeah, so as well as our own initiatives, we obviously get involved with all the Zurich Riders Bid partners. And um, we became the first business in the Isle of Man to switch to compostable cups. Now, I do appreciate that we have since changed that. Um, so we actually partnership with Manvend at the time and switched all of our plastic to compostable cups. Um, it was a big, massive thing. And then we kind of thought, well, why don't we go that step further? Why are we still having stuff that is single use at that point? So then we decided we would go and pitch and say, actually, we want ceramic mugs, we want glasses, and we don't want any sort of kind of influence to our staff. Now, as you can appreciate, some staff are a bit concerned about sharing mugs and stuff like that. So we have to do a lot of work in regards to making sure that we have eco-friendly dishwashers and tablets for as eco-friendly as we could possibly do it. Mm -hmm. um, and also advise them of all the cleaning and stuff so that they, they felt comfortable with it. And we did have a little bit of um, pushback at first, but now everyone embraces it massively. We encourage people that if they weren't comfortable to use them, they could bring in their own cup. It, it wasn't, we weren't saying you had to use our cups, but what we were saying was we were no longer going to provide compostable ones for you, basically. Um, we look to regularly educate our staff, so you'll see on this picture here, this was, um, we had a committee day, which basically had all the various different committees in Zurich who sold what they did. This was our stand. Um, most of it is local. I will appreciate that there are some much product products down here, mm -hmm. but however, they are eco-friendly and the way they're packaged <coughs> and all of that. So we did, we did our research and this was kind of letting people know, actually in your day to day, you can change a little thing, like you can get a, a bar of shampoo, it's still just the same job, but you're helping the environment. You can go to Jack stores, for example, and get all these little loofers and the eco balls for your washing machine, refillable. And it was more of a, okay, as a business, I, I don't need to shampoo my hair in, in the office, <laughs> but what can you, your staff do when they're at home? How can they make that little change again to make sure that we're trying to encourage as much as we possibly can. Um, we did a little competition, they won a little composter there, and we gave away seeded heart paper. So it was basically just paper made out of seeds, basically, you could plant it. And that was our thing, was that we gave it away to all of our staff that they could have a little heart that they would then go off and plant and it would make wildflower. And it was just that little kind of gimmick that made them realize actually, there's, there's something we can get involved in. Um, we then, obviously sorted out. Um, we have news feet around the corner from us in the business park and very aware that all of our staff go there for lunch. It's probably the only place they can go for our cycle 360. Um, and there's quite a lot of plastic in containers and stuff like that. So we actually did, did a deal with news feet and said, if our staff bring back their salad boxes, will you give them some sort of discount? If they bring it back to be refilled, obviously for health and safety, they couldn't keep it because they obviously couldn't reuse it. But if I took my salad box I'd used to take for in and asked them to fill it up, what, what would I get out of it? So they struck a deal with us, so we get a discount at Newsbeat if we return our plastic, which again, small win. It's, it's not a huge amount, but the staff go, well, actually, it's benefiting me, it, it's not costing me as much. So it's just having those conversations, and that was just literally an email saying, we want to do this, how can you help? So that was a really good thing. And then obviously we do loads of different education. So we've done the parish walk and things like that. So, yeah. Right. So a lot of the focus would have been around Zurich Isle of Man, but obviously Zurich is part of the global company. 
So Zurich do have bigger sustainability objectives. And we can't, I think the stuff that we do is quite local, but there is the wider pieces. So in terms of group sustainability, uh, one of the biggest ones is, one is launching a CO2 offsetting platform, which realistically since 2014, Zurich globally has been carbon neutral. And I know that's quite a big thing to kind of say, but what does that actually mean? Um, so in terms of what they do is all of, all of the business travel is offset. So it'd be purchasing units to go into renewable initiatives and projects. But again, I think it's, it's similar to what KPMG, it's all properly audited, it's really robust. So it, there's a full due diligence process that has to happen there. Um, move more recently, we renamed September as Climate Month. So I'm going to read out some stuff as well. <laughs> so we had 40 virtual events. Um, Throughout the month, including sustainability conversations between group, so our group CEO and group executive committees. We also launched Zurich Forest, which was in collaboration with Instituto Terra. If I haven't watched that, um, so that was a non-profit in Brazil, which launched, which is a, it was a really good sort of way for employees to log on to kind of a, a site and digitally plant a tree. But for every tree that was digitally planted, they would plant one in real life. So it's a little way to kind of incentivize and get staff engaged. Uh, and those bigger pieces as well. Um, so leading on to community pieces. So Zurich has made a pledge that staff gets three days towards community. Um, and they can use that in any way they do. So whether that's a Zurich organized event, doing collaboration with beach buddies, uh, doing beach cleans, tree planting with the Woodland Trust, or whether it's something they want to do independently. So they wanted to go work for the food bank for a day. It really gives employees that freedom and it's a commitment by the business to allow employees to do that. Um, in addition, we work with Onkin Guides. Uh, Zurich Isle Man is also working with Junior Achievement. So they, they sponsored that three year learn to earn program. And you may have also seen quite recently the Isle Listen. So there's quite a big collaboration that's going on there, which is all around wellbeing. Um, in addition, so Zurich Isle Man also have our own internal charity, so it's like a staff charity. And for every pound that's donated, it gets matched. So in terms of the raising, um, there's 40,000 40, that was donated to local charities. And during the pandemic, there's 73 donated to the community. So, um, and as I mentioned, yeah, the, the grant to Isle Listen. Yeah, so it's it's really important that obviously to make sure that everything is in place. You'll have seen obviously through the COVID, so that's kind of a very rough overview of what we do. So the, the charity committee with the um the community days as well is that we actually love them on the system and the group match them. So for however many people who do however many days, we get a certain amount of money into our charity fund initially. So we have a budget then at that point and and that goes back, our charity committee are dedicated and it's part of our ethos to make sure that that always goes into Isle of Man charities. So um, we support all the local ones. If we do bigger events like Macmillan and stuff like that, we actually put the money into an Isle of Man cancer place rather than there to make sure that it is actually being local. Our staff are the ones that are raising the money. We want to make sure that they're seeing the benefits of it. So that's basically what we've we've done it. And don't get me wrong, COVID has hindered some of the big bright plans we had. Um, there are a few things in the pipeline, hopefully, that will get released by the end of the year. Um, it's something that we continue to work on. But I think the biggest thing that the biggest message is is that we were two people in an organisation that's got 350 to 400 people in the office alone. And we've managed, don't get me wrong, with the help of the rest of the business and <laughs> NXCO and stuff, and sometimes probably not their favourite people at, the, at times, yeah. um, but we've managed to help Zurich do all of this. And I think that's the key message is that you don't have to be an expert in, in the area. Like before we started this, it was just kind of interest. Like yeah. it was, people were talking about it. We, were, we wanted to know more. And now, what, two, two and a bit, two and a bit years, yeah. um, it's, it's a passion that we've managed to kind of influence the rest of our staff to go, actually, 
we're going to start thinking about that. Like we come to this company because they actually think about all this stuff. So I think it, that if and if you take away anything from today, that would be the biggest thing is that the most random people like I work in IT, so <laughs> like <laughs> and we've managed to make this change. So I think it's just as long as you've got the staff who are willing, be it one person, twenty people, you can change something. Yeah, and I think I think the biosphere really enables that because yeah. it's not I think in some ways sometimes the message can feel like it's forced from the company. But I think the biosphere kind of provides an unbiased kind of one for you to align yeah. to in effect. So you're now kind of pushing your message, you're aligning to almost like a collaborative effort. So I think it's and I appreciate some of these things are quite big and quite big financial investments, but even you know, committing half the day towards charity is is it's, it's the little things that add up, and I think it's the mindset that gets changed ultimately, which is really where you start to see the value. And it's also worth noting this was never on the plan, this was never on the strategy, and never on the agenda. We are pleased to announce that it is now. We have a one page plan, and we have a section on sustainability. Our managers are accountable, our staff are accountable for certain targets, yeah. and that's all stemmed from. Two, three people sat in a room with two words, which is market presence. <laughs> so it, it's one of those where you just think, actually, you can do quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I appreciate we talked a lot. I think the that is a really compelling person story for people in the past. You know, it's not sort of top down, not forward driven down, not internationally driven down, but you know, as I say, two people who've made a heck of a lot of change there in, in loads of different areas, um, really demonstrating your commitment with the biosphere partner. Not all biosphere partners will be able to achieve as much as you guys have. They might not have the time or the backing or whatever, you know, but it's, you know, it's that platform of change as you identify. So thanks for sharing your story. Um, have we got time for questions? Yes, yes If anyone has any questions. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I have a quick question. Yeah. The, Obviously, you signed up for the biosphere. Mm -hmm. Did they provide you with a checklist that you kind of had to tick off to achieve sustainability? So, as a part of the biosphere that? pledge, you'll have seen it on Joe's piece of paper. There are like I think five or six, yeah, six, six pledges. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah. And they are very much a case of it. you can adapt it completely to how you see it. So, there wasn't a case of you have to remove plastic, you have to do this you have to do that it was more of how we interpreted that and how we thought we could then tick off those six so whilst there were guidelines it wasn't a massive it wasn't a tick box you have to do this you have to do that so it yeah. kind of left it to us didn't it i don't think it's part of that it's the pledge there's, there's six things on there but if you can align to one of those things and work on the others then that's that's ideal so i think it, and it's like what you mentioned before it's not about you have to <laughs> the hard checklist it's just about more of a commitment and it's trying to work towards something so i think when we went in we represented others as much but we use that as the focus to then drive more it's almost that question of is it local is it benefiting the people who are out on that street and if not why not and it, it's just more of kind of a a thought piece really i mean you can <laughs> it's, it's not really possible to get the checklist because all, all organisations are completely different. You know, you, you could be manufacturing, you could be service, you know, trade, retail, whatever. You know, so it's what works if you want to set it. Um, yeah. Do you, um, do you have any way to like calculate the people to work out their carbon emissions and what they can do to become yeah. kind of net carbon? Yeah, I mean, there are all sorts of online tools that will enable you to do that, but we're actually going to include it in our, in our training program that we're rolling out next year. Maybe if not working out precisely, you know, sort of giving you, giving you some tips to sort of offset and you know, deal with adaptation and mitigation. Um, but there are all sorts of fantastic online tools that you can, you can do. Yeah. Also, yeah. Martin is on our data. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. What you can do now is the consultant. Uh, what you can do with spreadsheet. <laughs> so if there are things that we can help to, to try and help you calculate that in, information, then please feel free to reach out. Like we're we're here to help. The whole point about Biosphere is to work together. So whilst we can't give you our numbers, mm -hmm. we can give you the kind of equations and stuff behind it to help help your business. So yeah, 
reach out to the partners that we've had nothing but if we've had questions and stuff like that partners have been nothing but accommodating and really helpful so if we can help them we have not to our team to say you know we've got this specific challenge and we can create quite easily match them up with somebody else who's had that challenge and led that challenge down the road and you know people seem really happy to collaborate and talk without sort of sharing board secrets or anything so <laughs> Okay, okay. Any more questions? <laughs> what you, you've done is amazing. It's really, really inspiring. Um, what's your biggest sort of hurdle or obstacle that you've faced in trying to drive this change and raise awareness? I mean, we were quite early to the game um, in regards to the, the company itself. So Whilst Zurich Group had inklings of this was the way they wanted to go, Zurich International, it wasn't on their plan, it wasn't their focus. Um, and we did struggle with that at first. Um, obviously, no budget and trying to put in mugs, like how are you going to purchase the mugs, things like that. Um, so we had to use our influencing skills a lot, um, <laughs> which has helped us grow as individuals. Yeah. So I'd probably say that the initial getting the buy-in is always going to be the hardest because people are going to maybe not embrace the change as much or be scared of what it actually means. But it's, as long as you work through it, like you can do quite a lot with a lot with hardly any budget. So my advice would be do the small things, do the things that don't cost anything, and that will get you the buy-in. And once you've got that buy-in, then you can expand more. So we we did little things at the beginning. We didn't <coughs> change the world immediately. And it was that that then got the buy-in from the staff. So I, I would say the challenges was was getting the buy-in in the first place. Yeah, definitely. But like Joe mentioned, like millennials and stuff like that these days, it, it's the forefront of what they're talking about. They want to know about how the planet's going to be when the kids are older. Like I've got a four-year-old. I want to make sure that I, I make the best life for her. So, yeah. Um, quick question. Yeah. Um, from an energy management point of view, there's an ISO standard, um, depending on the size of your business, may or may not be uh, suitable. Are you pursuing, I uh, think it's ISO 14001? Yes. So, I can't say that we're technically pursuing it, cause, but we have investigated into it. We've got a few other things that we want to do prior to then pursuing it. There's um, definitely a few more things we can do with the building that would then almost put us in that, that box immediately at that point. So it is something that we are well aware of. We know that a few of our as well do have it. Um, we are working towards making sure that we are, basically, basically that we've done, done everything that we need to do to make sure that we are compliant. So it, it is on our radar. So I would say it's a strategy as such. So, I mean, it touches a little bit on the gentleman's question in the corner there. Mm -hmm. Is that if you, if you pursue the 14,001, then you you have actually the obviously record of your inputs and outputs. Yeah. If you've got that, you can then begin to answer the question about CO2 emissions. Yeah, I think group have something very similar. So they have a sustainable team in group, but locally we don't. Um, we're very interested in making sure that our local CO2 is not just grouped into group because sometimes they do think about people on the island. Um, so we are looking to possibly do it just locally um, and tag on to the group thing. But we do, we have annual reports within group. We have quarterly where we have to fill in that lovely spreadsheet full of information for our sustainable group in, in, in group. So it, whilst we don't necessarily have that, we have some very similar within group that we are looking to. Uh, I think yeah. I said so our facilities manager locally gets to report into there's a system where you have to put all your waste recycling numbers, the energy usage, and that all ultimately feeds back to Zurich globally. So they do, and I think that falls into the how they can then make that type of hot being carbon neutral. Yeah. So where those stats ultimately go up to. I think from a local perspective, I think it's something that we're improving on. So we've, we've got the magic eye. So that's why like bolted onto nice utilities. So we're really focusing and making a more concerted effort to reduce energy usage or targeted energy usage mm -hmm. as well as recycling. Like, yeah. I think I mean the other thing was that uh, your presentation was given a, a good example of how grassroots interest 
at a, at a low level can ultimately uh, result in thought engagement. And so it's very pleasing to see that example. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely be <laughs> 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 pointing uh, uh, at this as an example of that. I should yes. just say as well that um, the master and Lauren did a, a webinar for us a couple of weeks ago, so we do have that recorded. So mm -hmm. if anyone you want that webinar to show to your teams at work, get in touch with Nicole and she'll be able to share that with you. Um, and <laughs> just to finish off, um, then, thank you very much for sharing your really compelling story of how you know, a couple of people can make all the difference. Thanks again to Jack and Chamber for hosting us. Thanks to Nicole for organising, thanks to you for coming along. Um, if you are interested in becoming a wise head partner and your appetite's been invited and you have any questions, please share my colleague has some business plans with her. She looks after our partnership scheme. Um, we'll be having a drop in session here at the Chamber. We'll be hovering around the coffee station from 11 o'clock next Thursday. Um, you can either make an appointment to pop along or just pop along. We have two, two hours left, I think, mm -hmm. so you can be here or just talk to us separately, you know, just, just contact us. Um, we're happy to try and answer any questions. So, thank you very much. Sorry, I do have one final question. <laughs> <laughs> about the, the start uh, of the business survey. When will, when will the results of that be available? I'm interested because there's a climate bill. Yeah, so we're not going to publish the results. The survey that we're doing is to help us shape our training. It's not right. sort of to inform the public. And, you know, we've got data no. issues around it and stuff. So we are, we, we are going out to businesses to say, what help do you need? What format do you want it to build in? You know, what time of day, what day of the week? In person, not in person? You know, do you want it to be a six-week program, or one-week program? So it's kind of all of that information that we're gathering in. How many people would you send it on? Um, obviously, I mean, there's been a lot of consultation lately on the climate bill and the various um, Associated strategies and stuff, so most people have their chances to have their say publicly on that kind of thing. And yeah, so this is to help us shape the pilot training program. So yeah, which I hope you'll take part in and um, so look out for that survey soon. <laughs> thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Well, thank you.